And switch into live now. Thanks for joining us once again. I'm Sammy K. Powers, and this is the PHP Roundtable. This is a live podcast of developers discussing topics that PHP nerds care about. The ultimate goal of this podcast is to learn, learn a little something from each other. Now, if you're listening live and you want to be a part of the show, definitely send a tweet to PHP Roundtable, and we'll get your question answered live if we can. Um, with new design patterns coming out pretty much every week, it's easy to be caught up in all the hype. And if you frequently try to implement the latest and greatest design pattern and feel constantly paralyzed by the thought, I know I'm doing this wrong, then this episode is for you. We'll discuss how not seeing the forest for the trees might be a good thing as we try to narrow our focus in order to write better code without thinking of patterns first. Now, we are talking about all this stuff with some really cool people. We're going to start this off in no particular order with Mr. Adam Wathen. He's a feisty active record evangelist. That's his, that's his intro. Welcome, Adam. <laughs> hey, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming. We also have Ross Tuck, who is an engineering consultant best known for wearing a hat. Welcome, Ross. Thank you for having me. Yes. And also, Anthony Ferrara, best known for not wearing a hat. That's his official intro. Welcome, Anthony. <laughs> hey, thanks again. So we take our intros very seriously here on the PHP Roundtable, as you can tell. Um, so <laughs> thanks, guys, for joining us. Um, and this, this, this actual talk, this discussion, was inspired by all three of you, actually. Um, in order, I think, uh, originally from Anthony, um, you had written a blog post called Beyond Design Patterns. And you had a talk by the same name, I believe. Uh, and it was focusing on basically looking at communication between objects and abstraction versus kind of like all these crazy design patterns overwhelming you. And also, Adam, on your on your podcast, Full Stack Radio, uh, you were focusing, um, you're, you're talking about the focusing on the smallest unit of code and refactoring towards a design pattern if it made sense, if I understand that correctly, but we'll get more into that later. And then also, Russ, um, we had a discussion in episode eight quite a few months ago, um, and we talked about the essence of DDD, and that was um, something that also inspired this uh, design. Uh, this episode, and my dance partner standing in front of me, making <laughs> making uh, hand gestures at me, and I was I asked her if she wanted to be on the PHP roundtable, and she said no thanks, and then she goes, and then I said, well, if Phil Surgeon is going to join us, would you would you join? She said, yeah, yeah, I'll join if Phil's there. So, um, so she and and Jeremy McCullough, she likes Jeremy, and, and so anyway, um, so I, I see without how we this, stand. What's that? I see how we stand. Yeah, right. <laughs> they feel very loved. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> so, um, all right, so without that distraction, um, so what is the ultimate purpose of design patterns? If we just step back for a second when we get into all this stuff, um, wh like, and this is for anybody, like, wh why do we even have them? Don't everybody talk at once, though. <laughs> I mean... Design patterns, when they originally were, were uh, developed, one of the inspirations was like architectural patterns, like things that we see in real life, um, you know, things that are well understood that we can reason about, that we can look at, and I think that they serve that same purpose for us in general, you know. They're ways for us to reason about code in small logical units, well, easily understandable units. Now, go ahead, Ross. I was going to say that I agree with that. I think that uh, there are ways for us to have a vocabulary to talk about these things, to, to reason about them. I think it's also because uh, naming things is very, very powerful. When we have a name for something, then we can assign it other properties, attributes, like, you know, this is a good trade-off for that, it's handy for this, it's useful for that. Um, and it's maybe not so good for that, or maybe it's less useful. If we don't have an easy name to hang that on, then we can't really assign properties to these things. Um, but I also think that if you look at the original stuff, it was also about um, having consistency. Uh, a lot of these patterns are, like, when you talk about them in terms of building architecture, they were for saying, like, hey, we're building this camp a college campus. It's going to be built over 80 years by different architects, but we want there to be some consistency to the proceedings. Uh, this is a reference frame. It's like a style guide sometimes for how do we solve this particular problem. It sounds like a good thing, you know, something that kind of we can all look to. But um, it seems like there's also been a lot of talk about some problems with design patterns, specifically how developers try to implement them. Um, is there kind of between the three of you kind of a shared view of um, a, a, there being a problem with design patterns? Uh, 
I, I don't think there's a problem with design patterns. I think design patterns are really important and something that's very useful to learn. It's it's one thing that I didn't learn in when I was in school for software engineering, for example, that made a really big difference in the way I think about code when I was when I did find the material myself and started going through it. I think I find though that over time, um, more and more I stop thinking about them so much and instead I'm just kind of like internalizing the mechanics of them and then I'm able to kind of apply them when they make sense without even really recognizing that I'm applying something that has this name necessarily some of the time. Like uh, I find like when I'm, you know, when you're working through like the original design patterns book or any of the spinoff books that came out of that, uh, the most interesting part for me was finding stuff like, oh wow, I never really thought about using an object for that particular type of communication before, or I never really considered that I could have two things talk together this way, and that's kind of been consolidated into a few pages in the book, so you can kind of see an example of how that works. And, and once you kind of understand the mechanism for the communication that they're trying to use there, you can kind of just stuff that in your back pocket or in your tool belt and carry it along with you. Um, I think I f find most of the interesting stuff to be in some of the kind of lower level design pattern stuff, the stuff that's about kind of day-to-day -day working with objects in code and not the higher system level architecture stuff uh, mm -hmm. I don't find to be as interesting sometimes or at least the way sometimes it's talked about is a little bit more prescriptive uh, as if like you're just supposed to like kind of cut your application this way and everything's going to automatically work or something. I think, I don't know that anyone actually says that, but I think as like an impressionable developer who's trying to learn and get better at things, sometimes it's easy to cling on to things that way and look at things that way. And uh, it'd be interesting to figure out how to how to fix that, that problem and have people instead look at them as just uh, opportunities to learn something about how you can make things work together in a system and apply it when it makes sense, you know? Hopefully that, that makes sense, but... I mean, I agree totally, and I think you you kind of alluded to the issue that I have with patterns, which is not that they're not useful. They're a hundred. They're really, really useful. It's when you're new and you start, you know, programming and you look down at a problem, and, and when you start asking yourself the question, "What pattern should I use here to solve this problem?" To me, that's a that's a negative. Learn how to solve the problem. And then after you know how to solve the problem, look and see, is that similar to a pattern or are there patterns that may better solve that? Um, but like the, the example I use is if you go to school for engineering, they don't teach you about architectural patterns. They don't teach you about like the actual mechanisms to build these things. They teach you the fundamentals. They teach you the core principles, the building blocks from which the patterns arise. And you don't actually start looking at the book of patterns until you know postgraduate or potentially even uh, you know beyond that. Like there, there's something that you should use once you understand the systems and the tools. You shouldn't learn the tools through them. That's my take on it. So it's almost as if you need to have the problem first before you know the solution. Is that what you're saying? Uh, to some extent, um, I, I think the. The, the patterns that exist, the Gang of Four specifically, are very much talking about the problems and not the solution, and that's the danger to me, to learning object learning coding from them, is you learn about the problems, you don't learn about the solutions. Well, you mentioned the Gang of Four, and we're going to get to that in a little bit more detail, so you've never heard of it. Um, Ross, you were about to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you were looking for consensus. I think you definitely have it. I think all of us agree that design patterns are actually a really useful concept. Uh, I think we would probably also all agree that the big issues with them are less the design patterns themselves and more the way that they're brought to developers. Like the way we educate developers I think is frankly kind of poor. Uh, there's very, very few good examples. Like where's a good book that shows you like, hey, this is a this is well-designed code. It's easy for us to talk about um, because we're all, you know, developers have been doing this a long time. It's easier for us to say, you know, like I I studied the way, and then I followed the way, and then I moved beyond the way, you know? But there are still people who are just figuring out what the heck is the way, and the, the, it's completely lost. And the only reference we give them most of the time are design patterns, say, like, hey, these are useful bits of code that are well-designed, and that's not actually true. A lot of that has changed over the years, but we don't have a good reference for them. We don't know how to teach them. Uh, teach them. And I think another big part of it is culture, that we use tooling, for example, that often uh, pushes us toward a particular design choice or a particular framework, especially in PHP, and those come with set or certain patterns that they prefer for things, and it becomes ingrained in people's mind about that way. Like, uh, we have to move beyond that tooling, but it's it's hard. Uh, there's, there's very few guideposts there. 
I think um, I think it's interesting that you mentioned that there's not like a lot of good examples of showing like when or why you would apply this stuff a lot of time. Like you look at a design patterns book and it's literally just like a catalog of patterns. It's like when you run into this like kind of isolated unique problem, this is a isolated unique solution for it. And it's not in the context of like, so you're building this application and trying to solve this problem and this requirement comes in and you have to implement it in the context of this existing thing and what's the best way to do it. And I, I think the best resource that I found for that, and maybe there are better things now, but the thing that was most helpful for me when I was learning is this like criminally underrated book called Agile Principles, Patterns, and Practices. Uh, it's an Uncle Bob book, so you would think that more people would talk about it, but it's like a, a huge book. It's like 400 pages or something, and there's like a giant worked example uh, at the end where they walk through building an application and things just show up like, okay, well, it makes sense to use... Uh, a command for this and this is how we do it and using like the more traditional like self-executing command pattern like the gang of four command pattern but there's lots of cool stuff in there and that was probably um, that was like a real light bulb for me reading that and starting to actually understand what object oriented design was and how you're actually supposed to build systems so if anyone is looking for uh, or is in that place and is really trying to like get their head around like what direction should this communication be happening in or like how do I know when these objects are coupled? Like, what does that mean? Stuff like that. I thought that was a really well-written, uh, eye-opening book for me. So, Well, speaking of books, um, as you all three have kind of already alluded to, uh, um, sort of indirectly, Adam, you, were, you had mentioned something about where this kind of prescriptive look of things. Um, Ross, you had talked about how we offer an explanation to new coders with this, and Anthony, you um, you mentioned the Gang of Four, which is, I think, is a reference to the, the four authors um, of a specific book on design patterns. Um, I, I've got the all four of the authors' names here, but um, I'm really bad at pronouncing names. So the last names are Gamma, Helm, Johnson, and this last guy's last name is really hard, so I'm going to say John. That's his first name. <laughs> Bliss said this. Um, but uh, this book um, is called Design Patterns, Elements of Reasonable Object-Oriented Software, and there's basically 23 classic if you will, design patterns um, described in the book. And they're broken down into three main categories. And I think this is kind of, um, I think, Anthony, your blog post kind of um, kind of looks at these specific patterns. Um, but the, the three categories are creational patterns. So these are patterns that deal with creating new objects, structural patterns that deal with um, the architecture of object, objects, and behavioral patterns dealing with behavior of objects or, or the communication between the objects. Um, now, I'm not, I haven't read this book yet, so I'm still, I'm just kind of going from the, the TLDR version. Um, but uh, Anthony, you, you were in your blog post proposed breaking these um, three categories down into different categories, three different categories. And you said um, the category should be really, if you think, you can think of them as shim patterns, which are patterns that exist because, like, the language doesn't deal with the situation very well, so, like, offering shims. Uh, compositional patterns um, that exist for um, a series of objects that need to be assembled together. And, de and the opposite of that, decompositional uh, patterns where you're breaking up single objects into several ones. So um, I'm curious what your process was for thinking of breaking those design pattern down, design patterns down into those three different categories as opposed to the prescribed ones from the book? Yeah, so really I was just kind of experimenting. I was, you know, something felt, I don't want to say felt off, because off is the wrong term, um, but I felt like there was a commonality between these patterns that wasn't really expressed by the, uh, the, the categorization there. So I just, I came up with a whole bunch of stuff, tried grouping things in different orders, and I noticed this really interesting kind of pattern emerge and in, in the blog post that you talk about, there's actually a table in there, and you see that when I kind of settled on this a little bit, and I saw this nice pattern where you have the majority lying on this diagonal line, uh, comparing the the the, um, the the two different groupings, and it just kind of felt interesting. Like I'm not saying that this is should be the grouping or this shouldn't be. You know, one is better than the other. More of when I looked at it this way it seemed interesting. You know, so I took the kind of mathematical approach of, it seems interesting, so let's figure out what does this mean. Well, your, uh, your talk, I feel like um, more recently, so your blog post is from like 2013, I think it was quite a, quite a while ago, but I think you had sort of um, kind of expounded on it or kind of in your actual talk, you kind of went into further detail. And I, I, if I remember correctly, you said that um, basically design patterns just translate into input-output, I.O. stuff. Um, is that a little little more nuanced than that? It's not okay. input output, 
Um, once you look at shim, if we throw away all of the shim patterns, if we use languages that don't suck, or we just focus on <laughs> like dealing with languages that don't suck, um, really you're left with these compositional decompositional. Well, what's the difference between whether you're writing or you're refactoring? In practice, there's a lot of difference. So there's really a good use for having those patterns separated. But when we're talking about like learning about things and learning about architecture, there really is no difference. It's the technique is different, but the end result should be pretty close to the same. Um, so I eliminated half and start going down that route. And when you start looking at them, you can very, very quickly reduce yourself down to basically two different type fundamental roles that these patterns serve. Uh, communication between objects, individual objects, and communication between systems. So I basically say, well, part of object-oriented programming is that you can treat an entire system like a single object and a single object like an entire system. So really, all of these patterns do one thing, and that's control messaging and control information flow. So it's not really I.O., it's more of the message that's the important thing. And when we sit down and we focus on that, um, the messaging, that really, to me, unlocks what object-oriented programming is about. And that's why... I, Oh, it's not about the architecture. It's about the information because that's what it's all about. You said it's all about messaging. Does that mean we should implement PSR7 on all of our objects? Not the kind of messaging I'm talking about, but yes. <laughs> that was kind of a troll. Um, well, how does all this stuff... Um, this one's for Adam because um, kind of thinking about some of the things you brought up on your uh, podcast about... Um, I mean, you've discussed this a number of times where you focus on the idea of looking at the smallest unit of code and refactoring towards a design pattern, if that kind of makes sense for your specific context. Um, and it sounds like it kind of plays into exactly what Anthony was saying, and it's like kind of looking, instead of being looking at all these design patterns, kind of look at what they all kind of do at the core. Um, what is what is your kind of take on that, What is your, from, from that perspective? Yeah, sure. So... Um, it kind of comes from a couple things that a couple guests on Full Stack Radio said to me. So... Um, I, when I was talking to Corey Haynes, who's like a pretty well-known developer in the Ruby community, and we were talking about uh, the four rules of simple design, like the Ken Beck stuff, because Corey wrote a book about it. He was talking about this book called Refactoring to Patterns, and he was talking about the idea that, you know, patterns aren't something we implement, they're something that we refactor towards. And I actually haven't had a chance to check out that book yet, but it sounded like an interesting idea to me in general, and I think... <clears throat> I think it makes a lot of sense. The part that I think I find more interesting is kind of what Anthony was talking about, where Kent Beck actually said this to me, too. I, I specifically asked Kent Beck when I had him on the podcast, you know, everything that you've ever written about, you know, all the articles you've written, books you've written, it's always you're always talking about low-level programming mechanics. You're talking about things like naming classes, parameter order, should this method be on this object or on this object, but I've never seen him write about higher-level architectural ideas. And his response was that, to him, it's all exactly the same. Like, you can apply the exact same style of problem-solving thinking to a whole system or set of systems that you would to a set of objects. And um, I thought that was really interesting and really resonated with me and made a lot of sense to me. So lately, I've been, I've been focusing on trying to spread that message a little bit and, and helping people uh, who don't necessarily have as much of a grasp on the low-level stuff as they need to understand that there's still a lot to learn there and all that stuff is going to bubble up and help you think about designing better systems at the end of the day because I definitely have I've worked on projects with junior or, or intermediate level developers who are trying to implement architectural patterns and stuff uh, that that they just end up kind of making a mess with because they don't understand how to keep the smaller bits inside of it clean and well-organized and behaving and communicating in the right way as well. So I think it makes a lot more sense to me to get good at those kind of like small pieces and let that kind of bubble up into being able to do a good job at the higher level stuff than trying to somehow implement some of these more advanced system level architecture ideas and, th and thinking that that's just going to result in a well-designed system even though you don't have the knowledge that you need to make things work properly at the low level, you know? What are some of the smells if you... Oh, go ahead, Anthony. No, no, I was going to say, that's, that's a really interesting thought. Um, I recently had a conversation with Yitz. We work together at the same company now, a code rabbi, and we were just, I think, Friday, we were having a conversation about microservices architecture and, like, the right way that services should be related to each other and, like, how DDD fits into that picture and everything like that. 
and I brought up a thought, which was, isn't a, a, a service a service, regardless of whether it's in a monolithic application or it's across a network boundary, aren't the principles the same? I mean, obviously the trade-offs are slightly different, but the principles are the same thing. So an architecture that works in one place should, in theory, work for another. I don't know. Like, it, I don't know whether that's a right view or a wrong view, but what you said kind of just feels along those lines and... Oh, I think that's just an incredibly interesting thought. I'd like to get you guys' take on that. Well, one thing that uh, sticks out to me is that um, you know OOP is at the end of the day all about messaging, and whether we're messaging at the object level or whether we're messaging at like a server level or a microservices level, or you know a lot of those design patterns are the same. Like if you look at a proxy, for example, the difference between an object proxy and an HTTP proxy are actually kind of not that far apart. I mean, how you might implement a decorator uh, for caching and the way you'd use varnish. In principle, they're not that different, really. Um, and I, I have a lot of clients, for example, who are really interested, like, yeah, we want to do micro uh, service, microservice, microservices. And I say, yeah, but you don't know how to build good object composition yet. And object composition is local, it's fast, it's easy to test, you don't have uh, deployment problems or anything like that with it on the same scale, but you don't know how to do that right. So why do you want to add more latency and more complexity and more deployment issues and everything on top of that? And it can be very, very good, but the trade-offs are not a fit for your situation. And if you look at the, the success cases for that, for example, um, like uh, Sam Newman, who wrote Building Microservices, right? That's now the de facto book. Uh, good stuff and thought works about it. They all say it doesn't work well for greenfield projects. It works great for brownfield because you don't know enough about the domain. You don't know enough about what you're doing yet because it's still all messaging and you need to have a better, well-defined service. Um, but I would also say uh, there's a there's one of those walls of programming, I can't remember the guy's name, um, but he said um, that you can try and abstract the difference between a local service and a remote service, but it's just never going to work out in the end. Like, you kind of have to give up on that idea. But I agree with you, like, in principle there, that it is the same beginning to end, and I think that's why folks should focus better first on getting that object-level stuff right, because it's a simpler form of messaging. They just don't look at it that way. And I think, again, it's a problem with the teaching of it. Like, we can tell people, you know, music is about the space between the notes, but when you're wanting to play, it sure seems like it's about the notes. Yeah, that's totally exactly the way I feel, for sure. Um, and I think people, like, you know, basically like you're saying, they reach for something like microservices when... You know, they don't really notice that the real problem is actually just that, you know, they could have probably architected it, they could have made a monolithic application the way they had set it originally, had they just done a better job at all the smaller pieces, using the same sort of thinking that they're going to have to be good at to make the microservices thing work anyways, right? So people kind of, I think, are looking for solutions in the wrong place a lot of the time. I think so, and, and a lot of it is, uh, if you ever watch a junior or meteor developer, um, watch what happens sometimes when you move beyond like where the framework supports them, right? And as soon as they get into like, uh, I don't want to say building a domain model because let's not harp on DDD too much, although there's interesting design pattern relations there, but like uh, look at just building um, calculators uh, or something like that, like some kind of complex reporting. As soon as you move beyond like what folder do I put this in because there's a predefined folder setup or something, like it kind of falls away. Like they don't know what to do. They get confused or lost and they say, okay, back up a sec. Forget the fact it's an application. What would you do if you were building a library that solved this problem? And like, oh, I would just make up an object that did this or this or this. Well, that doesn't slot into a nifty design pattern, like not one that your framework supports. But it makes sense. Just to that. You know? But uh, people get nervous about it. They, 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 that's why they fall apart, I think. It's, it's all the same reasons there, that once they move beyond like what they have a ready, accessible thing for, it, it just gets confusing because they don't understand the basics. Yeah, I totally agree. I think like um, the thing with naming design patterns, right, is that it's powerful for all the reasons that you talked about. But uh, sometimes when you're first getting into that stuff, it can feel like you have to label every single object that you make. You know what I mean? Every single thing you have to make is is something. Someone's given a name to it. It's some sort of pattern. And people stop thinking about just like designing objects that are focused on doing something and are able to communicate in certain ways that make sense for your application. And you can throw all the by-the-book design pattern stuff away in that case as long as you understand object-oriented fundamentals that you know drove out those design patterns originally anyways. And you're going to end up with something that's... Uh, you know, you're going to end up noticing those patterns in your application after the fact, too, as long as you've kind of internalized them when you learned them and started to, and at least, like, 
took that exposure to those ideas and kind of built that into the way that you think about solving problems. And I think that's the right thing to do with that knowledge versus trying to figure out, okay, I have to make this object. Now, is this a proxy or a mediator or a memento or a visitor or a template method? It can be a template method object. Is that even a thing? You know what I mean? Like, um, you just get focused on the wrong things and start worrying about categorizing everything when that's not the right way to think about designing the way things should be communicating. Definitely. You just want to be like, yell at them and be like, it doesn't matter. It works. That's enough. <laughs> Well, and, and there's another level of danger to that, which is you get the wrong terminology. I mean, a lot of us like to harp on Laravel for their use of the facade, but there's an even much, much more egregious one, which is observer. I mean, if you look at object-oriented code bases out there in the wild, I think I've seen exactly one use of the, the observer pattern that was actually the observer pattern. Everybody implements a mediator, and then they just call it an observer. And they're very different patterns. I mean, yes, they do very similar things, but they're used for very, very different reasons. And a lot of people don't internalize that there's a difference between them. So, you know, the, the, the having the common terminology and the common verbiage is a great benefit, but it's also a great risk because people learn the wrong verbiage or don't learn the terminology associated with the actual concept that, you know, it's supposed to be, and then hence that can introduce significant confusion too. I think it also tends to lock us like into particular um, implementations. Like a funny one that uh, uh, there's been discussion about today on Twitter, for example, again is uh, commands. And Adam mentioned earlier, like the orthodox, you know, the the self-executing commands um, versus like ones nowadays where we typically implement a handler because maybe that's a little bit easier for dependency injection. It's still kind of a command. I mean, it, it is, but the the implementation differs. And I think that, like as you say, like we don't want the terminology to drift too much. But on the other hand, it's like as you said, the design patterns a lot about the intent. And it's like we can get by with confusing observer and mediator often when the intent is the same. Like, hey, we're just broadcasting events. Um, but yeah, it's it's like this weird balance between do you want a, a frozen language or an evolving one. So you mentioned a couple times about getting the names right, and that's one of the things that I uh, particularly struggle with. In fact, um, not knowing, I haven't um, dived super deeply into this stuff yet, and that's something that one of the reasons why we're having this discussion is because I almost need to kind of talk with some experts before I really dive into it and start really feel like I'm drowning. But the one thing that I've been doing is calling pretty much anything that pulls three or more objects together a service. Um, and I know that's probably kind of like way off because like I think technically in, in some situations you would call it a facade, um, not like the Laravel facade, but you know the one that kind of um, is supposed to basically create an interface for a large body of code or in other situations it could be a builder system, a builder pattern, you know like construction complex objects. Which on that one it could be a factory, you know. Like I don't know. Like I I just get so confused with like, is it really important the names and like the names? Is it more like as far as getting the name right? It sounds like it's more important like re recognizing the context of what the pattern is versus the actual pattern itself. Oh uh, yeah, definitely, hundred percent. I mean, in my talk and actually I believe in the blog post, I talk about five of the twenty-three that are literally the exact same UML. Um, proxy facade adapter, not bridge. Uh, I forget the other two, but literally, there's five of the patterns that have exact identical UML. So the exact object structure is the same. The difference comes in why and the constraints around. So like you, 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 you mentioned here, facade is facade the right thing there? And the answer is maybe. Um, you know, the, the rule of thumb I use is a facade is a simplification of a more complex system, not a replacement for it. So if those, you know, you, you say you have three, three or more objects in the background, if it's okay for a consumer to use those objects directly, what you've created is a facade because it's handling the common use cases. If it's not okay to access it directly, then you're creating kind of like a service or some other, uh, an, a, like a non-gang of four pattern there. Um, I like to call those ones objects. That's what you're creating. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah that, that, that's right. <laughs> so, um, and just to throw this specific um, case out here, um, I was thinking of the Facebook PHP SDK. Um, there's a lot of components, a lot of different objects that control what's going on behind the scenes, but we offer one, basically, API that controls all the things. It's like the master super service, if you will. Um, 
I, I thought, okay, maybe that's a good candidate for a facade. It gives like this kind of one object for you to work with, but you just mentioned that if you're able to access the other objects that underlie um, that one, then it's not a facade, right? I don't know. I'd go as far as to say it's not a facade, but like that that's the general litmus test that I, I use is like with my understanding of what a facade is, is that it's you know the simplification of a complex system, not the re, not the interface to a complex system. I mean, uh, gotcha. it could go either way. It's, it, you know, this is one of those things, and I see a lot of newer developers get really, really, really hung up on that that point. Uh, well, is it a facade, or is it a proxy, or is it a bridge, or is it a whatever? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You know, pick something that's reasonably appropriate. And in this case, if you would were to call it a facade, I'd be like, okay, sounds like sounds like a facade. All right, whatever. Let's move on. Um, but the, the names matter, but they're not so critical that we need to, you know, hash everything out and figure out what it does. Does the system perform well? Does it abstract what it's supposed to abstract? If the answer to those two questions are yes, what is it? Who cares what it's named? Yeah, and a lot of time I don't think it's a good idea. I mean, I think it is a good idea to avoid letting patterns leak into the names of the stuff you're making anyways, right? I think it, um, if... Obviously, there's going to be situations where something exists to, like, as an implementation detail, this thing that is an implementation of some pattern exists to facilitate some behavior that you need. But, um, you know, a lot of times that's the difference between calling something a product repository or a catalog. You know what I mean? A lot of the time there's a better name for something as it pertains to the system that you're building that maybe under the hood is implemented using some specific pattern. But uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's important to worry about letting the patterns that you're using dictate the way that you're naming things in your application. Is that true for, like, totally. open source? Say that again, sorry? Is that, kind is of... that true for, like, open source and, and that type of thing? I don't, I, I don't know that I've ever thought about the distinction between how things should be named in an open source project versus, like, um, an application that you're building. I think um, I would do it the same way across the board. I guess my thought is just, um, as far as... I guess trying to keep everybody on the same page, but if not, if nobody even knows what these patterns even are to begin with, then that makes it really hard to get everybody on the same page because nobody's on the same page, you know. Well, I don't... <laughs> that that's the use case for design docs. You know, self-documenting code, code should describe what it's doing, but that doesn't mean that architecturally we shouldn't have design docs, that we shouldn't have other forms of documentation. If you want to say it's a facade in the design docs, go for it. You know, even if it's just in the file header in the comment of the class that says, hey, this class acts as a facade to this backend system, great. But do you need to name the class XYZ facade? That's, I think, the point Adam was trying to get to, and I definitely agree wholeheartedly. The only one of the patterns, I just pulled up the list of them, I'm looking at it, the only one that I look at that I normally do name the class after that is the mediator because, I mean, that's exactly what that, that object is. You know, dispatches. That that's the only one I've I've ever seen that personally, I felt I couldn't name better in the application context than the pattern name. Yeah, and I think the the key word there really is context. It's uh, it depends on how you communicate it to people. And I do think you raise an interesting point that about uh, open source versus closed source. That you're going to have different means of communicating with people, and you may need to take that into account in your naming scheme. That's going to be really important. Um, if for no other reason, it's like uh, we were saying with service, like service is the most overused word in all of IT. I got a slide once where it's like joking about like, yeah, you've got this service, that service, that service, you know, blah, 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 blah. They're all called service. It just depends on the context you're in. Um, and I think that's probably what we miss a lot. Um, it's interesting because all of the, the design pattern work that we have normally comes from a guy named Christopher Alexander, right, who wrote this book that inspired the Gang of Four to write their book and so on. And... Um, uh, Addy Austin, I think, uh, one of your former uh, uh, Google colleagues, uh, he turned me on to, um, what is it, Patterns of Small Talk, uh, which actually is a foreword written in the 90s, I think, by Christopher Alexander as an intro to a computer book. He says it's the only foreword he's ever read that disses the book it's leading into. He says, because Christopher Alexander is very flattered that people have brought his design patterns into there, but he also feels a little ashamed because they're missing context. Like he doesn't know how to put patterns in context there. And, and he says like, yeah, it says put a window here when the sun is facing that way, but only if there's a tree not outside the window. Otherwise you're just blindly following this pattern. 
and that's the part that that we miss. We don't communicate well. We don't talk about trade offs. We talk about implementation too much, you know. Um, but I don't have a magic fix to to transmit that knowledge better. But I do think. Like coming from somebody who wrote several books on the topic, if that's what we're missing then, we're probably still missing it now, even though it's 20 years later. Well, Alan Kay, the you know the inventor of small talk, the inventor of arguably of our object oriented pro- object oriented programming as a whole, himself had said he thinks that everybody in the industry gets the wrong thing from object oriented programming. They focus on the objects. And it's not about the objects, it's about what's between the objects. It's about the messaging and the decoupling. And, and that's what the entire point was when he created it back then. And Java and the modern view of object oriented programming is focused completely on the object that we kind of forget that these methods are actually messages that we can send. And these patterns are patterns of communicating, not patterns of structuring. Uh, I mean, th- there are architectural patterns as well, but if you focus on that communication, that gets the point across a lot better. Um, how do we teach that and communicate that? I have no idea. Um, I tried to a little bit in my that beyond design patterns talk, and I've gotten really good feedback off of it, but I don't think that's nearly enough. You know, it's it is what it is. But Anthony, what, what, um, can you expand a little bit on, or and actually for all three of you, because you all kind of alluded to it, but what is it that you exactly mean when you're talking about not focusing on the objects, but focusing on the communication between the objects? What does that mean? What does that look, kind of look like in a, in a descriptive kind of way, like in a real world, as opposed to more like a prescriptive view? It's difficult to say really concisely. Um, the way I talk about it in the talk that we referenced a couple times here is you, if you look at a method not as you know a piece of code that you dispatch, if you look at the method as communication, that I'm communicating an intent, I'm making a remote procedure call, named this with this payload, and then it's up to that object to figure out what it wants to do, and it's going to send me a message back. It's you could look at it from this from the like more of a procedural view or the more of a functional view that that code is you know defined on an interface somewhere which then gets proxied back to a virtual method which then gets executed because this object declares that method but that misses a lot of the dynamicism in, in the language and then when you talk about things like duct typing well you can't duct type in that world in like in in the world where you where you look at object oriented programming as interfaces and classes duct typing makes zero sense. You, what do you mean? You're just going to call a method on an object? That, that, that's nonsensical. How do you know that that method's going to exist? Well, to message passing, it doesn't matter. You know, it's, you're giving that object a message and saying, you figure out what to do with this. I don't care. You know, it, it, different philosophies, but focusing more on that communication, I think, is the, the really, really interesting part. But again, I don't do this really well either. I think what you were saying is actually really important. It's something that maybe we don't talk about enough in the PHP community, but the difference between like calling a function on an object versus sending a message to an object are like very fundamentally different things to me. And the fundamental difference is about like how much knowledge the caller has about the receiver. So if you're calling a method on an object, you know that the method exists. And this is like one of the reasons I kind of like rant against type hinting in PHP sometimes, <laughs> because you're kind of specifying like I need an object that provides this interface because I know better than that object does about its ability to respond to the message that I want to send it. Um, so I think of it as kind of like you have an object that's calling a function on another object, it can like see into that object and can see every message, or sorry, every method available on that object. And it chooses which one to call. In like a more message-y kind of world, and kind of the way like Ruby and Smalltalk are designed, it's almost like every single object just has the same API, which is just one method called send that takes the name of a message and the parameters to that message. So you have no way of knowing if an object is compatible with the message that you're sending. It's up to the receiver to decide if it's compatible, not up to the caller to decide if it's compatible. And I think that kind of ties into one of these principles that Alan Kay thought was really important in object-oriented programming, which was like just 
as late binding as humanly possible all the time and pushing responsibility away all the time as far as possible. Um, so that's why I feel like using things like method missing in Ruby or like double underscore call in PHP are like very object oriented ideas because you're putting the responsibility on that object to decide what to do with that message and you're making it explicit that that object is deciding what to do with the message versus the caller. Like something that I think would be like an interesting thing to exist in a in a language that I don't know if it exists in any object oriented language well, it would be like something like how double underscore call works but it's like happens before the method gets called. So you could like intercept messages before they get sent to the actual method. You know, things like that. To me, that's like what object-oriented thinking is about. It's about thinking, okay, I've got a message com coming in. Now I want to decide what to do with it. Maybe I want to delegate it to this object that I hold a reference to, or maybe I want to do something specifically with it with a function that I have. Um, when you're using like explicit interfaces and stuff like that, that distinction between like um, the idea of deciding what to do with a message is kind of lost because you're just explicitly implementing whatever methods exist and each one does whatever it's supposed to do and the caller knows about each one versus that kind of decision making happening inside the receiving object. It's kind of an abstract weird thing to think about but when I started thinking about things that way it really kind of opened my eyes to thinking about object nerd programming in a little bit of a different way than I had when I was first getting into it. Adam, have you played at all with Go? Not really. I've like I have a little bit of exposure to it, but I haven't actually sat down and tried to write any of it. So Go takes a really interesting. I'm not yet. Go takes a really interesting approach to that exact problem, because having those types, having those declarations, becomes incredibly handy, especially at compile time, static analysis, etc. But what they do is they invert the dependency. So you still declare I want something that implements this interface in the method for the parameter, but the interface binding happens lazily. So when you declare an object and a method on that object, you don't declare that it implements that interface. You yeah. just declare the method and yeah, then it's structured. About this. Yeah, it's like the implicit interface thing, right? Yep, Where exactly. you could say I need something that has these three methods. As long as I pass something in that has those three methods, whether or not that thing knows that it's implementing the interface, it'll still work, which I think is a really cool kind of shift in responsibility for sure. And um, just to kind of talk about, like, you know, I kind of was saying I don't think, like, explicit interfaces and stuff are OO or whatever. Um, they have a lot of benefits besides what we're talking about. I'm kind of talking from, like, a very purist kind of object-oriented world. This is the way to think about things, I think. But you lose all the documentation benefits, the static analysis benefits and stuff. So it's not, like, black and white for sure. It's just an interesting thing to think about, I think. <laughs> Ahead, yeah, I think that's an interesting one, too, because it's like, as you said, it's all about the benefits of it. And uh, I think if you look at oh, a lot of the newer developers who are coming at this, they don't have, like, they don't remember the C days, for example, or, or like a pre-object-oriented world. And uh, they, they forget sometimes that the language is set up in a way to provide certain benefits or, like, common patterns that we discovered. And if you take a step back and think about it from a language design perspective and you say, like, oh, this is a class in PHP, there's a list of methods I can call, but then you step back and you think about, well, the methods are kind of like the class is receiving a message and then the methods are like a big switch statement so I can forward it to a particular block of code because it's a nice, clean way to organize it in my file. You know, that's a, that's a horrible uh, oversimplification, but that's kind of the the approach that people need to like step back and realize that the PHP aspect of it is just a tool that it looks like a certain thing because we found out that's a handy way to organize it, but maybe it's not actually reflective of good design or what's actually happening under the hood. Uh, but if you spend too long with a particular technology or you come at it at a later point where these things have been formalized and was talking about it as much anymore, y you kind of missed out on what happened in that discussion. So it can be a lot more confusing to separate the language from the design aspect of it. Well, and that kind of hits in on another deeper point, which is, um, you know, you can write the paradigm using any tools. I can write object-oriented code in C. It's a pain in the rear end, but you can do it. You can write procedural code using objects in Java. You can do it in PHP. So a lot of people who are learning now are learning how to use objects in PHP, but I would argue they're not, most of them are not learning object-oriented programming. They're learning some hybrid where, yeah, there's some elements of object-oriented programming in there, but there's a lot of procedural in there as well. Um, I, I 
disagree with certain other relatively big names in the OO community or in a PHP community as well, in that I do not believe a single code base should be single paradigm. I believe that some use cases and some problems lend themselves naturally to being procedural or being object-oriented or being functional. Um, for example, like dealing with user input, it's really, really hard, my opinion, in my experience, to model user input, like that very, very boundary layer um, when you first get the data into the system. It's hard to do that anything but procedurally. Um, some of your data transform uh, data transfer objects are very hard to do non-functionally. Like, so I think any good, sizable code base is going to have pieces of each in it. And in my opinion, that's good. You want that as long as you make it explicit where those boundaries are and make it explicit how that behavior propagates throughout the system. And that's the step I think a lot of people, me, myself included, miss. Have you guys ever heard of uh, Gary Bernhardt before? He has this talk that he gave called Boundaries at a summer Ruby conference a long time ago where he talks about this idea of functional core imperative shell, which is like a design paradigm he kind of started working with later uh, in his career. And it ties in kind of to what you're saying there, which I think is interesting, the idea that, you know, working with, like, user input and taking someone's intent and convert and pushing that into something that happens in the system, a lot of time makes sense to do it in a more imperative way. But that's a really good talk for people to check out uh, if they're interested. He talks about combining functional and OO principles and uh, the imperative shell stuff. It's, it's pretty insightful stuff for sure. Well, you guys have mentioned uh, compiled languages and functional languages and all the different types of ways of approaching this. Like coming from the PHP pers perspective, when we're used to kind of duct typing and and scripting and all this stuff, do you feel like the um, the way that objects communicate with each other f fundamentally shift as far as like the paradigms that kind of support that communication between, say, a functional language or like a compiled language versus PHP, <laughs> or is it all the same? It's a lot of it, I think, is just what the language makes easy. PHP makes those inter explicit interfaces easy, and it makes the dynamic interfaces easy, and hence that's why you see the two of those being used a lot. What it doesn't make easy is normal functions. You know, if you look at the vast majority of frameworks out there, how many of them have functions, namespaced or global, that they use? Very, very, very few of them. In fact, I maintain a polyfill for PHP 5.5, Point four minus, you know, an older uh, password hash, which is literally four functions, and the number of pull requests I've gotten against that that package to wrap those functions in a class, and it blows me away. It's like, what is the purpose? What what benefit do we gain? It can't be polymorphic. It can't be you know, you get none of the normal object oriented benefits by just you know putting a class at the root of that. It's I think that comes down to tooling. Functions suck in PHP, and that's something I hope to change in 7.1. But yeah. ooh, ooh, what are you changing in 7.1 with functions? Can you give us a teaser? So one of the RFCs that I have in draft, I'm just waiting to do a patch on, is uh, function constant and stream auto loading. So basically, making a generic auto loader that can load auto load anything. I think that's one of the big problems with functions right now is you simply can't auto-load them, so everyone wraps them in a class. Yeah, very cool. Have awesome. you guys, what you were just saying reminds me of this tweet by John Carmack like four years ago where he says, sometimes the elegant implementation is just a function, not a method, not a class, not a framework, just a function. <laughs> it's got like, uh, let's see here, 994 retweets, so pretty, <laughs> pretty good stuff. <laughs> Well, I, I don't remember who did it, but there was this fantastic, fantastic talk about um, command objects, command patterns. Um, I believe he touched on model view controller and things like that. And he, he goes through the entire talk, and at the very, very end, he winds up distilling all of your controllers where you used to have these gigantic classes down to a single two-line function. And they all, every single controller was just this two-line function. I, I got to look up the, 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 try to find that talk again, but it was this, just that really, really brilliant distillation of normally we build classes around these things and make objects and all this other stuff, you know, with dependency injection, yada, yada, yada. But why? If you can do it in a single function, does it make sense? Yeah, and 
it's um I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. Um, it is again about I think you know what's idiomatic to the language, right? I mean, principal least surprise comes down to not just uh, this is what I'm familiar with, but uh, this is what's natural in the community for people to support. Like um, I maintain a, a command bus package, and I've talked to a couple of people who really hate the command bus package, um, and I say, you know. Talk to me about why. And they say, well, you could do it a lot easier, like the middleware layers and stuff, you could do that a lot easier with functional composition. And I'm like, that's true. It would be a lot easier to just do it with functional composition. But it's not natural to most PHP folks. And again, because of the language, again, because of culture, again, because of history, it's a shame. Um, but I do think that there's like this, this balance of like, this is kind of what we know, this is where we need to take it a little bit. Um, and, and kind of push the edges, but in a way that, that people can continue to follow there. Um, I do think it's really interesting, like, there are design patterns for functional languages. And if you look at places like in the Scala world, where you have these mixed paradigm languages, which are becoming more popular, um, like that weird hodgepodge you get of sometimes it's a loop, sometimes it's a map, sometimes it's, you know, and people are still feeling those things out about, you know, what's a good trade-off for those different parts of the code base. I think that's really, really cool, actually, and I want to continue to see what happens because I do think that's probably more of the future, like uh, not just because of multi-core and all that, but I think functional is just catching on in a broader sense, and I think that's going to start a whole other wave of design pattern thinking and reanalyzing that, that people haven't done for the past decade. And I'm really excited about it, actually. Yeah, functional programming and, and, and talking about immutability specifically has become kind of like a, a, the new hotness in the, P, I don't know, maybe not the new hotness in the PHP community, but it seems like a lot more people are talking about it today than they have before, for sure, which uh, I'm pretty excited about, like this whole idea of state. Oh man, this is another topic. We need to we need to have another round table about this. But um, we are we are kind of getting kind of close to the time to start wrapping things up. But I did want to um, ask Ross um, kind of specifically on the domain driven design stuff because Ross was on on episode eight to talk about this um, quite a little while ago. Um, and when we were in that episode, we broke it down design uh, domain driven design into to kind of two ways of thinking about it. First, we explored the essence of DDD as kind of a set of abstract ideas and principles that kind of help us understand or I, to help us deal with the complexities of software. And the second thing that we looked at was kind of looking at more tactical DDD or exploring the concepts that um, that help us like actually implement it like entities and value objects, services, domain events, and all that stuff. Um, so when we looked at the essence of DDD, was that essentially like we're breaking down kind of like DDD in a kind of like a really abstract kind of way. Um, I, is that kind of like what we're doing now with all design patterns? And is that kind of part of the DDD um, paradigm? Like is that something that is, is, or is that just some way of helping understand DDD? Okay, so that's a, a big one. Um, on the DDD, DDD front, it's, it's interesting because um, DDD is in my thought process, it's a series of design patterns. Um, and it'll often be broken down into what you say the essence of DDD is, which is like the strategic stuff, which are these high-level things like bounded context, ubiquitous language, and those are really where the big benefits of DDD are. Um, about like, as Anthony said, it's like all this quest for boundaries in your application, and, and DDD is really explicit about finding those boundaries and making them easy to see um, and communicating well about them. Um, but people are often distracted, I think, or latch onto the tactical stuff which is the actual things in code, the entities, the value objects, the services, the repository, stuff like that, because coming from our perspective, that's easier to understand. Um, the way I like to look at it is that uh, those things are often a distraction from the big benefits of DDD, uh, but they're not that separate. They're actually kind of part of one big feedback loop. Like, the, the big innovation to DDD is often the ubiquitous language of the bounded context, but I would argue it's this uh, admission that the implementation and the design influence each other. So I'll start off with something that's a strategic bit of DDD, and then I'll try and hash it out in code, and then I'll come back and say, that's feasible or that's not feasible, or I had this extra insight when I'm building it, and then that loops back around into the design again, and then it keeps going from there. And the strategic part is just a set of design patterns, but for, for thinking about code and not writing it, actually, or talking to people. So uh, design patterns work for a lot of different things. Uh, I guess it just depends on how you see them. I know that's sort of a big wishy-washy answer, but that's that's kind of my take on it. Cool. I thought Anthony had something to say there, so I was just waiting for that. But I I always try to monitor the uh, 
the the body language and like somebody leans forward, I'm thinking, oh, it's going to say something, and then I'm like, oh no. <laughs> No, I mean, the, the only thing I would add to that is the, I, I believe it's Uncle Bob Martin who talks about architecture in one of his keynotes, who said, you know, architecture is the art of drawing lines with the interesting way, with the interesting property that all dependencies must cross runway, you know, and it's, the, the, this notion of boundaries just keeps coming up over and over and over again, like Ross said, whether it's DDD, whether it's patterns, whether it's object composition, whether it's, you know, object or programming in the, in the concept. That's, I think, the interesting thing, and that's what I kind of want to study more, just in general, is the, that boundary interaction on all levels. So as we start to wrap it up a little bit here, um, I'm curious if there are... Um, i got two, two more questions for you guys. First, um, are there any design patterns that you feel that you implement kind of pretty frequently pr uh, across lots of different contexts? You just see repeating over and over and over. I think I think probably the most common, you know, by the book of design pattern that I would will implement is the adapter. Probably I use that constantly. And decorator, those are probably two of the most common ones that I use. Sorry, Anthony, should have been faster, bro. Dude, that, those are literally the two same ones I was going to say in the exact same order with the exact same justification. I mean. <laughs> Great minds think alike, but fools, fools rarely differ. So I don't know what that says about us, but I would I would maybe also throw out there like I've been doing a lot of stuff lately with messing around with specification objects, which I think are often used just for kind of complex tests, like true false stuff. But if you dive into it, I see it more and more as a, a really interesting fancy form of builder. And so I've been using it for stuff that I would have never expected before. Like I wrote an ACL library earlier this week based on specifications. I was like. I can't believe this works, but it does, and it works great. So. One other one I'll throw out there. I use the one, uh, the true facade very often, the Laravel one. Uh, <laughs> oh, dear. Troll, troll. <laughs> Well, uh, on that note, uh, I actually do have one other question for you guys. Um, what advice do you have for kids like me who feel like they can't even write a basic CRUD app sometimes without getting completely paralyzed by the idea of trying to make sure I'm doing it right with the right, saying the right things or calling the things the right things. What, what do we do? <laughs> Don't be afraid of failure. Failure is a good thing. Getting it wrong is a good thing. You know, you could do this for 20,000 hours for 10 years, and if you've never failed and done it wrong, you've learned jack zero. <laughs> and if, you, if you're writing your tests first, everything fails at the beginning anyways, right? So to get that failure out of the way, right up front. Assuming you're say, the test. Nice. Well, that's something that is probably a useful thing to do. I would say, like, um, I would say just kind of try not to worry too much about the big picture and let that distract you or, like, um, paralyze you. Just kind of think about the exact problem that you have to solve right in front of you right now and just try and solve it and try and solve it in a way that you're happy with the solution. Um, to me, that's kind of the only way to work, you know, just like one step at a time, trying to keep the code healthy the whole time. If you have some new insight tomorrow that makes the design that you wrote yesterday no good, change the design that you wrote yesterday. Don't feel bad about it. That's how emergent design happens, and that's how, you know, building software works. So just do the best job that you can, and don't feel guilty about changing things or feeling like you got things wrong, because it was probably right at the time. <laughs> but nothing's right forever. There's no such thing as right forever, so... Uh, my philosophical advice would be um, be vulnerable. That's hard to do sometimes, but it's really important. And there's a difference between um, uh, being afraid and being vulnerable. Uh, one is good and the other isn't. Uh, on a more practical note, I would say, for Christ's sake, don't read uh, Gang of Four. It's a terrible book as an intro to design patterns. It's dense, and it's 21 years old, and it's frustrating, and it's not fun to read. Go pick up um, head-first design patterns, or uh, there's actually a really good design patterns book in Ruby. Uh, just like Gang of Four, if you're going to make that your first intro to design patterns, I think you're going to find yourself very frustrated, actually. But it, it is a... a a landmark piece that you should go back to, just maybe not at the start. 
I would plus one the head first one. I didn't read the actual one. I tried and it was just like too painful. The head first one is awesome. It's all full of pictures and bulleted lists and all sorts of shit that makes things fun to read. <laughs> <laughs> the one other thing I would suggest would be do not open a book, do not open Google, turn off your internet connection and try to write some code. Try and fail and fail and try and just keep going until you kind of start to understand. I mean, there's a deal proverb that everybody wrote a framework, and the, the people who were smart wrote it, learned from it, and then threw it away and used something else. But, you know, you, you got to build it, and you got to see the failures to be able to appreciate what we get for free out of the box. I have a new way of coding now, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn off my internet, um, have a local version of PHP running with a random number generator on an array that's got three keywords in it, and every class is going to suffix with entity, service, or facade, and then just code an entire application like that. I think that's a pretty good start. It doesn't have to be or. You can combine those as well. <laughs> Abstract hey, value right. object interface is one of my favorites. I use those this all This isn't Java. We don't need problem factories. <laughs> Nice. Uh, have you guys ever been to classnamer.com, actually? No. Go to classnamer.com. Actually, go to the spring version of classnamer.com. So if you... Uh, where can I post a link that everyone can see in the chat here? Yeah. Check this out. Classnamer.com. Oh, serializable object context. Let's um, copy-paste that into GitHub and see how many... <laughs> Abstract how many embedded EJB decorator exception. Uh, oh, wow, well, it's this, actually this, in this abstract code. hierarchical velocity identifier factory. Pass through spring scheduler factory factory. <laughs> are, any, are you finding any of these on uh, on GitHub yet? I haven't. I have not looked on GitHub yet. Stateless but. task dialog. Let's see if there's anybody on GitHub that has that. Dynamic Just... cookie monitor bean. <laughs> have you guys seen Fizzbuzz Enterprise Edition? No. Yes, you should also take a look at uh, PHP Simple Plus Plus. That's also Legend. excellent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you bring up uh, Enterprise FizzBuzz. We used to do a programming challenge many, many years ago that we called Code Bowling. You know, the opposite of golf. Golf is to try to make the shortest, simplest. Bowling was to try to make the largest, most convoluted th uh, program to solve a very, very simple task. My favorite winner was one that allocated... Uh, something like 14 gigabytes of RAM to add two integers together. And, and like, it, it did it... Like, it wasn't obviously trying to allocate that much RAM, it just it was so deceptive in what it was doing. It was amazing. Nice. Well, Anthony, I actually have one bonus question for you, just uh, to kind of end on a Anthony... Um, or on your the way you ended your blog post. Um, you concluded your blog post on Beyond uh, Design Patterns with... We should also rethink OOP, object-oriented programming. What, what, what was your? I don't want to turn this into like a 15-minute thing, but, uh, but just what were your thoughts on concluding it with that? Well, we've already discussed that at length here. It was about more about rethinking it towards the uh, message passing than you know the, the class-oriented way that we currently view it. So we've already done that. Okay, cool. I I just wanted to make sure that there was no other like um, things uh, next. Um, RFC for 7.1 that you're going to change the whole way that PHP does OOP. Oh. oh, no, no, no. I have a couple that are in plan. I want to do algebraic types. I want to do pattern matching, and I want to do structural typing. Oh, nice. Pattern, pattern matching, please, 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 yeah. please, please, please. please. See, I won't, I, I've never submitted an RFC before, so maybe you can help me with this, but I wanted to put one together for, like, active record as a language construct. Oh, no. Uh, that's... I, you should do it. Just do it. Just see what happens. I'd love to see what kind of things happen on the internals mailing list about that. But seriously, you have to do it seriously. You can't just be like, haha, this is a troll. You have to be like, I really want this in the language. So, so we really need things like that on internals list because you need those honeypot threads to see who the real trolls are and who, like, who actually cares about things. There was one brilliant one like a couple weeks ago. What was that? Oh, was the one with three, a couple weeks ago? Uh, it was the... Oh, it was because is set is... If it's is set or null, and we need a, a, a new operator called does not exist or something like that. <laughs> to, so we can differentiate a variable not existing in the symbol table with it being null. Like, yeah. Nice. <laughs> I'd like to see well, the real-world problem that uh, 
spawned the need to create that RFC. Dude, it, it was a cent- it was a centi thread. It was you know 120 <laughs> replies, something like that. If you ever want some entertainment value? Go back and read through that. It's amazing. Awesome. Nice. Well. This has been an awesome discussion, and I've learned tons. I've got, I've got to actually re-listen to this one uh, when I'm in my car, so I can just like re-soak what you guys have been saying and and try to improve myself and and get better at all this stuff and just make every every day get a little bit better at coding. And that's I think what we all kind of try to do. Um, and I want to wrap this up with the developer shout out, like we always do. And this is a segment that recognizes really awesome people in the community for just being awesome and, and contributing to the community and helping us all learn. Um, all the people here on the PHP roundtable on the panel could totally be uh, given developer shout outs. In fact, Ross, you got you got one not too long ago. Um, and so yeah, so. Uh, Let's see. Sorry, I lost my notes here. Who we're actually nominating? Oh, so the developer shoutouts. Um, we send a fifty dollars Amazon gift card to this de- developer to um, say thank you. We send him a custom thank you note, a handwritten thing with my horrible handwriting. But the fifty dollars Amazon gift card is sponsored by Laracasts.com. So if you're here on PHP Roundtable, you're listening because you want to learn more about PHP. Then Laracasts is something you got to check out because um, it's the Netflix for developers. You go on there, you see screencasts of this guy Jeffrey Way doing really cool things in PHP teaching you how to um, do a lot of things in Laravel, but he does a lot of things outside of Laravel, too. He's talking about just general testing and, and just how to code better and stuff like that. So thanks so much, Laracast, for sponsoring the developer shout-out. And the developer shout-out for today is Case Yan. And, Ross, why did you guys uh, nominate Case Yan for the developer shout-out today? Uh, he's just a generally awesome guy who I think is sort of criminally underrated in the community. He's uh, sent in PRs to projects. He's really involved in stuff. He does amazing work with React PHP and async just in general support of PHP. Uh, he's an awesome guy, and uh, we just really need to, I think, uh, appreciate folks like that and tell them that they're seen, they're noticed, and that we, we couldn't be here without them. So thanks, man. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Case. Well, I'll be trying to get a hold of you. Um, uh, just get your snail mail address and get this uh, card in the in the mail to you. Um, also, uh, let's wrap this thing up with some shameless plugs. Um, Adam, you got anything you want to plug? I got a podcast that's pretty cool. If you want to check that out, called Full Stack Radio at fullstackradio.com. Um, other than that, not really. <laughs> It's an amazing podcast, by the way. I um, definitely, when I started listening to it, um, a couple actually, somebody from uh, it was uh, oh shoot Nathan Stokes uh, in uh, the F8 episode of the PHP Roundtable actually promoted your podcast on the like uh, like when I was asking for everybody to promote stuff. And uh, at the time, I hadn't heard of it, or I had heard of it, but I never listened to it yet. And so I started listening to it, and uh, I'm like, crap. PHP Roundtable has a has got to really up the up the ante to to be on the same <laughs> like you raised the bar with that podcast so much I'm like oh my gosh now I got to spend even more time on the show notes so uh, yeah you got a great podcast so thank you excellent excellent job well what about you Anthony do you got anything you want to promote uh, just the my company Grovo G R O V O uh, you got a hat sorry is this uh, not with me no oh. <laughs> I don't wear hats remember. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> nice. What about you, Ross? You got anything you were printing up? I got, I've got two real quick. Um, I'm doing a workshop in Paris uh, next month in November uh, about DDD design patterns, good code all around, uh, doctrine. Uh, it's uh, You can find it at phparchitecturetour.com. I'm doing it with Matthias Nobick. He's an awesome guy. And uh, I'm also uh, co-organizing a non-profit cross-language conference in Utrecht uh, next month as well called DOMCODE. You can see it at conference.domcode.org. It's like tickets are 80 bucks, international speakers, uh, learn about all sorts of stuff. It's going to be a lot of fun. So we hope to see you there. Awesome. Nice. Well, um, our next couple of episodes coming up are going to be kind of kind of fun. Uh, the next one, I think, well, they're, they're, I don't know what the order is, the schedule sensitive, but uh, the next one's um, probably going to be about debugging. Debugging is more than var dump, believe it or not. I just I had no idea. Um, but we're also going to be talking. I wanted to talk about immutable PHP. Right? We've talked about this a couple of times with functional programming and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, this needs to be another topic. It's actually on the schedule to talk about um, doing immutable things in PHP specifically. Maybe we can get some internals people to talk about adding some con- constructs to the language that supports immutability. I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about it. Let's see what happens. Uh, and then also on December 4th, uh, that one's tentative, but it's kind of in stone. But if you're a fan of Room 11 on Chat Overflow or Stack Overflow, you ever hang out there, we're having a Room 11 special uh, December 4th. So definitely make sure to be in chat 
uh, the chat room 11 around 5 p.m. C C uh, Central Time, and we'll be do a kind of a an impromptu roundtable there, have a little discussion of what's going on on Room 11. So I'd just like to thank Adam and Anthony and Ross for joining us for this episode. An awesome discussion, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ben.